going to be good. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started because we're going to try to keep this within the hour. We have uh, four or five others that may be joining and, and jumping on here with us. And if they do, I don't mean to uh, not stop and greet them. Uh, we may or may not depend on in our conversation and how we're doing. So we do want it to be uh, an interaction. I want to be like sitting here. I'm in one of our prayer rooms, meeting rooms here on the Owasso campus. Uh, and you're in your home or living room or office. And so we just want it to be as though we're sitting together talking. And I'm glad that James is on here with us. Uh, and John may jump on here in a minute. Uh, here from uh, the Claremore area, Jonathan here, as far as Desi Life, Owasso campus. We uh, I just want to share a little bit of our story and, uh, and why these concepts, I think, are so important because I remember uh, years ago, back in the 80s, uh, uh, being taught a lot that uh, church government does not matter and that uh, we get a choice in what we want to do. And at that time, a uh, teacher in Tulsa was teaching real strongly uh, that it was the pastor run government of the church. And I know what he was doing. He was moving from a deacon board idea with a pastor or some kind of trustee board and a pastor. And he was searching and he saw, at least in the scriptures, that there ought to be some means of spiritual oversight and directive and government. So he determined it was pastor led. It was among a lot of the charismatic word of faith churches. And so that began to be real popular uh, in, in the eighties. And that's really how most uh, independent non-denominational charismatic type churches were set up and uh, set up to this day. They even set up an organization of president vice president and so forth and so on and uh, to kind of keep control of that and so it's not unusual for you to see that uh, others of us come from denominational backgrounds where you have a deacon board uh, and the pastor serve kind of as a board uh, in the last uh, two decades some of those deacon boards have now been called elders we want to talk about what is a true new testament elder what's a true new testament deacon and how some of those have gotten blended. Uh, you might actually have someone that's a true elder sitting among deacons along with what they would call the pastor uh, or senior pastor, uh, or if you wanna call it the set man or lead elder, whatever you would call it. And they end up serving you know, as a board, so to speak. And in the denomination I was in, it was the deacons that were elected by the people, the pastor was elected by the people, and then we served as a board. And so I remember in the early 80s, reading words in the scripture about what's a bishop, what's an elder. Uh, in those days, uh, there was some teaching about prophets uh, among some of the folks in the Tulsa area, but no one would mention the word apostle. In fact, most of them were not even going to embrace that. So you had a portion of the headship of the church. You had uh, Christ the prophet, you had Christ the pastor, and then Christ the teacher, and sometimes an evangelist. So when the scripture says he ascended on high and he led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men, the preeminence of Christ is seen, I believe, when all of Christ is recognized in the church. I hesitate teaching a lot on the fivefold ministry outside of groups like this because people get the idea they want to aspire to be in a fivefold ministry. And I think that is a misnomer. And we'll get into that maybe another time and talk about why, why I don't believe we are to aspire. We're to recognize and find and discover what Christ has done and is doing in us. But nevertheless, uh, you see the, these ideas. And so I remember in 82 grappling with this, you know, what's a bishop, what's an uh, apostle, uh, what's a five-fold ministry, uh, what's an elder, what's a deacon. And I didn't know how they fit together. You know, were bishops over, deacon, uh, over elders or what's the word of bishop? Is an elder one the same? And so I struggled a whole lot. And then in 84, when the Holy Spirit spoke uh, to us about uh, the apostolic government of the church. And then in 85, things began to unfold. 
and begin to see the church government almost in every part of the Bible, it seemed like, as we look through and just begin to take notes and start the series on what's a true New Testament elder and what's a true New Testament deacon. So I want to talk about some of that uh, today, and I want you to jump in, ask questions. Uh, you can raise your physical hand, or you can raise your hand on the uh, Zoom meeting, and we'll stop and interrupt. I like for this to be a Socratic type teaching for you to stop me anywhere, uh, it's because we just want to be close, intimate conversation. And so as I talk through this, uh, feel free to jump in. There's so much to say. I'm going to try to limit some of my, my thoughts so I don't go too broad. But I think it's helpful to get some of the history of how we have grown into our understanding and how we walk with brothers who see it differently. And that's OK. Uh, and if you see it differently, that's OK. Uh, it's only with those whom we build and it's only with those whom we feel like God has given us an entrance that it is of significance for us. Because I remember when we were teaching this a lot in the 80s, I'd had friends come to me and say, Glenn, if you're right, that means so-and-so is wrong. I said, no, no, no. No, I, that's not my place to do that. I have to build with the conscience that I have, with the integrity of the, of the I see in the scripture, with the reasoning from which I come from. And uh, I saw some significance for God's government because it came to me by revelation. Now, if I go to somebody else and I start talking to them about the significance of God's government without God dealing with their heart about it, it's just going to frustrate them. And they're just going to say, well, it doesn't matter because they're not, it's not coming to them by revelation. And I recognize that and I'm okay with that. So I'm not, that, that's important because I think without the understanding of the why, the significance of it and the fruit that we have seen over the last three decades among congregations without God's proper government and congregations with it are almost night and day in dealing with issues in the church and building generationally and releasing people into their gifts and callings. So there's a whole lot of purpose behind it. This is not a how to, this is a why to. And it has to start there because in, when we got this understanding and taught it in 86 and 87, we had our first big conference here in Claremore. There's 450 more people registered and signed up from Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma. James, you'll remember this. We call it the apostolic order of the church. People came from everywhere. And after it was over, you'd have thought I would have been excited about those Sunday through Wednesday meeting. It was a dynamic people, you know, so excited. Uh, but I started weeping in my office one day and I was grieving and I asked the Holy Spirit, why am I grieving? And I heard the Holy Spirit say they came to find out how, and I wanted to show them why. And immediately it made sense. James, you'll remember people even coming to you and saying, would you come up here to Kansas and set our church in order? Would you come and show us how to do this? And it's so grievous because that's the nature of man. Man wants a method. I don't want to walk through life. I don't want to walk through relationship. I don't want to walk through a change. I just want a method. If you show me a method that you think's better, I'll set it up. And so most of the conferences we go to is go to find out how to. And so we get very little impartation. We get very little of transformation. We get a lot of information. So you come home and you try to implement things. You try to put things into place. And I remember as a young pastor doing that, not with church government, but with everything else, whether it's church growth or I'd hear about this idea and I run over here with this idea and I go to this conference, I get this conference, I come back and try to implement it. And I had never birthed out of prayer who we were. I had never grown out of it. And so I often say to someone who's starting planning a work or raising up, you don't even have vision for five to seven years. I, I mean, you know, and I, and they've said to me, oh, that's not true. You know, we've got vision. No, you have a dream. A, a, a dream is this is what I'd like to see, but the vision has some more clarity to it. The vision comes out of your DNA. 
the vision comes out. This is your economy. This is a part of God's economy that God has set you in that city for. This is the part of the strategy that you're to play. And you don't know that at first. And God, I think, keeps it from us because we grow into it. And if even if he were to come with an angel and say, here is the vision, it still would not be yours until you began to walk it out and get a grasp of it. So I think that's real significant, especially for the younger ones, because sometimes you feel frustrated. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know the vision. I don't know what, that's the way it's supposed to be. God wants you to grow into it so that you don't just adapt something that somebody else is doing and make it a, a vision. And, and because it really comes out of the spirit. With all that being said, that's why I think this God's government has got to become important to us. Otherwise, we won't see the value. But I'm working right now with a situation where I've seen where God's government is not properly established. And I've seen working with places where God's government is being properly established, and it's totally different. Uh, and when I believe when you set people in that God hasn't set people in, you really have issues that is hard to deal with. In other words, we're not here to go ordain us some elders because they're not our elders. They're God's work and he's got to discover, they've got to be seen, they've got to be raised up, they've got to be discovered. And so we don't want to rush out and do anything. So as we talk through this, I want to talk about some of the things we see in the New Testament. And uh, let me just uh, pause there for just a second. I kind of threw a lot out. Uh, anybody want to make a comment or um, uh, affirm? Uh, any of you guys have been around this for a while, feel free to uh, make any comment. Otherwise, I will, I will keep moving. Glenn, I'll just jump in there real quick and say um, that I I don't think that could be more more right. You know, I've been a on compensated staff as the campus pastor here on the Claremore campus for five years as of this last August, and and I feel myself right inside that timeline. Like I I I didn't I didn't ever see myself becoming a quote unquote pastor on, on staff somewhere and and but every member is a minister so my life just kind of grew into this just God's leading and direction and it's taken you, you capture vision you capture dreams and aspirations but even in my own heart and it's for Steph and I together I, I feel that 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 what we have now is really vision and direction and what we brought into it and, and where we've come from and we've been able to partner and obviously underneath your leadership to, to, to come alongside and to carry that and execute but but I just want to in, agree and say yes and amen to that that I, I felt that as you were saying that I thought yeah, that is so right for me like just where we are and in, in five years even just seeing really starting to see the fruit of people's lives being transformed and really starting to see the vision of things being carried out and really starting to see people take ownership and step into places. And man, it gets you excited. Uh, so don't be discouraged if, if you're two or three years into it and, and you're still trying to figure stuff out because you're right where God wants you to be. <laughs> so yeah, I just totally agree. Yeah, that's excellent. Very good. Very good. I'm going to uh, uh, use a couple of, of, of slides here. It's not that it's important, but as I go through here, I might refer to something. If I do, I'll share my screen with you as we go through. My heart is today is that we would talk about your work, and I don't mean specifically uh, in detail, but how this applies, what what we see in the in the New Testament that's different than what we all grew up with is that you do see a team of people. There's a team concept in the scripture, whether it's an apostolic team or whether it was the elders that Paul called together from Ephesus in Acts 20, or whether it was the Acts 13 that there were certain prophets and teachers 
that got together to pray and seek the Lord. You see where Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, I am a uh, fellow elder among you, though Peter was an apostle, he was a fellow elder, and he's talking to them as elders. And I recognize that in the New Testament, the city was the uh, locale. The church was only divided by locale. It wasn't divided by groups and denominations and sectarianisms and things that we have today. So we really are nearly 2,000 years removed uh, from that idea uh, of the idea that within the city there is one church and that those elders whom God raises up are elders in that city. But I believe the principle works for every group of people because it's his church. So I, I know a new congregation, you would not have more than probably one a husband and wife, maybe as two, uh, leading and serving as a pastoral team, or elders in that in that sense. You, you probably wouldn't have more than that because the congregation is small. You've got responsible people, but hopefully you're in relationship with those of the other members of the five-fold ministry. Hopefully you have relationship with apostles and prophets and evangelists, because most of us would be there shepherding and teaching. So I don't know that every local congregation has to have all five, but I believe if the body of Christ is going to uh, honor Christ as the head, there needs to be a relational aspect component that we're connected, uh, not because we just made that connection happen, but we recognize whom has God placed in my life. And, and he always has sufficient what's needed. He always has uh, the place of what's needed. And I think that's comes out in, in Corinthians where Paul says, you desire earnestly the best gift. I don't think he's talking to me as an individual, Glenn Schaefer, that I'm to desire the best gift because he's talking to the church. And unfortunately, we read the New Testament for ourselves rather than as a church. The church is how we should receive uh, the New Testament uh, it's for us individually, but, you know, he's talking to the church. He says to the church, you desire the best gift. And so I think the church needs to see what gifts do we need and, there, and embrace those gifts. So we always see that, that team orientation. We see that, that concept. And so I, I don't want anybody to feel like, oh, I've got to go get a team. No, I don't mean that. I, I, the mindset, the mindset that God will provide for himself. God, he already puts around us. And people start running out and trying to associate with somebody out here. So, no, just look at whom has God put around you. Look, look to see whom you're related to. If you're in trouble, who would you call? <laughs> you know, if you and your wife had a problem, who would you go to? I mean, you know, who, who are those people that God already puts in your life? Those are the ones that, that may be the ones that God uses, you know, to draw and maybe serving in that capacity. So it's easy to, to discern. It's not hard. Uh, we're, all, we're often looking for some grandiosis or, or something, you know, that's well known or uh, that might make us feel better if we were connected with somebody that's famous. And that's not the church. You know, that's not the way Christ works. He works out of humility and those whom he's placed. And so with that in mind, I don't want any pressure as we talk about this coming on anybody because it's all natural. But at the same time, I see in the church the principles that are there. And so we reason, here's how we reason in the scripture. We reason it from 1 Peter. If you want to open your Bibles there, uh, we reason from the scripture out of several places in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12, uh, Acts 13 and Acts 20 are some of the passages that I'll reference you to that we would reason from the scripture on church government and many other verses of course philippians you know he mentions uh the of the saints the overseers and deacons i, I just i'll mention that and first in philippians 1 uh verse 1 he says to all the saints in christ jesus who are at philippi with the overseers that word is episkopos or bishops and the deacons diakonos and these he makes 
succinct and, and clear from all the other saints. So you do have two offices in the church. Uh, Peter, I mean, Paul talks to Timothy about that. You have the office of the bishop and the office of the deacon. So we do know there are two offices, and I'm going to submit to you that the five gifts of Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 are not offices. I'm going to submit to you that those are functional gifts. Now, I know it's real popular right now to use the word apest, apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. And I do like that because it's easy to remember. It's kind of neat. Um, and one of the things I like about the apest teaching is it's getting into denominational churches where they wouldn't normally embrace uh, the word apostle, uh, the word prophet, uh, They, but they will in light of using this idea of apes, that this person moves apostolically or this person moves prophetically. My caution in that is that most of the teaching I'm seeing along the lines of apes fall closer to personality profiles than true functional authoritative gifts in the church. So they fall short of saying that there are true apostles. They say there's apostolic tracks, there's prophetic tracks. And so at least the conversation is taking place. And to that, I say, amen, praise the Lord. Uh, I, back in the eighties, you wouldn't even use the word apostle. <laughs> and it wasn't until the nineties, you use the word prophet. And now you have to make sure you still explain yourself about either one of those gifts, because some people think you're talking about somebody who walks in the third heaven and thinks you're part of the original 12, and they forget that Jesus is the apostle, then there's 12 apostles of the Lamb, which would never be replaced because they had to have a, a requirement from John the Baptist to the resurrection. So those are in the foundation of the church. Those can never be replaced. But then after the ascension the post ascension apostles there's a number of those there's 12 of them referenced in the new testament so count jesus there's 25 apostles in the new testament count the original 12 and jesus and the 12 that's mentioned in the rest of the of the new testament so we would call those post ascension apostles so we're not saying that they're apostles with the same commission we're not saying they even have a commission at all compared to what even paul did even though paul would fall into that post ascension apostle his commission was to the Gentiles because God had to have the Gentiles have an apostle sent to, to open up what Peter was given the keys to open the kingdom to the Gentiles. God called Paul. He said, who's out of season. And yet the grace given to me was the same measure given to Peter. He says, when I went up to see, uh, see Peter. And so the grace was, was there, and that meant he had the authority to write scriptures. The apostles of the post-ascension uh, apostles don't because their commission is not given to that. Any apostles today, they're functional, but they do have authority, spiritual authority. Same way with prophets. They function, but they do have, they do have a measure. So all of that being said, uh, when you get over to 1 Peter, that's where we're headed. When you get over to 1 Peter, Peter, we know, uh, is an apostle himself, and yet he says he's an elder. So we know that right there is an example of someone who's in the fivefold ministry who's serving as an elder. And I'm going to make a case here that we believe that eldership, the prerequisite, is someone who's been raised up in one of the five gifts of Ephesians 4.11. He's called some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. For what? The equipping, the perfecting, the maturing of the saints. So that is the work of those fivefold with the saints. They're eldering in that sense. How do we know that? Because he says in Acts 20, when he called all the elders together, he says, to whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's that word again, bishop, episcopos. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So this wasn't something man appointed them to. They weren't elected to this. Uh, this was discovered and seen as the Holy Spirit brought them forth. And sure, Paul and Titus and the apostles that he sent ordained elders in every city, but they weren't raising their hand and vote to appoint them as elders. They appointed because that's who they were. So 
we want God to raise them up and reveal them. And there's a process that we teach on how that is seen and understood, I believe, according to the scriptures. And Peter's a good example where he said, I'm an apostle who's also an elder. We know in the early church in Jerusalem, there was apostles and elders, it says, uh, because it seemed good to them in the Holy Spirit there in the council of Jerusalem. But James seemed to be the lead among them. So in any terms I use, I'm not trying to say you can't use different terms. So please hear me. But uh, around us, you won't hear us use a lot of terms of gifts. We won't probably say uh, our senior pastor, Glenn, unless we're trying to introduce somebody out here at a banquet in the community, we might say overseeing pastor. You know, we might try to make some explanation because people, they, don't, they, they get that. They understand that. But in our heart, we recognize that there are those among us that function with spiritual grace as their gifts are as elders. So you'd have a set man or a lead elder or a primary elder among elders, like James would have been that. James would, and the reason is believed that James was is because when everybody spoke and he gets up and he says, okay, here's what I say. And the people went for it because he had heard what was said among the multitude of the council, and yet he gave a directive. So that's what we're, we're seeing and reasoning from. Now you see Peter, who would have been a part of that uh, now in, in Peter 5 saying, I exhort you elders, it's plural again. He's talking to them as, as, as elders, uh, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and as well as the protector of the glory that's going to be revealed. And he tells them to do two things. Uh, I'm going to put this slide up on my up on the screen here if I can, uh, right quick. Hang on just a second. I guess I should back out of here and share my screen, shouldn't I? Let me do that right quick. Not that you need this, but it might help us in our... Can you see my screen, everybody? Thumbs up? Okay. Let me use this screen here. This is what we would see. Uh, he's an apostle right here. He said, I'm also an elder. Now we know in Acts 13, there were certain prophets and there were teachers. Okay, so that's three of them right there, right? So prophets and teachers. So we see examples that they were given leadership to the church there in Antioch. And we know Paul was also a teacher because he says later that he was. And he was commissioned out of there as an apostle. So he and Barnabas were not necessarily functioning apostolically or as apostle. Uh, like obviously he had emerged, obviously the gift was there, but the commission had not come. So he was functioning, no doubt, there at Antioch and establishing them in the faith and the foundations of Christ as a teacher an apostle, and then sent out, commissioned as the apostle. So again, you see an example of three of the fivefold. Well, obviously a shepherd is going to be have the ability to equip and be a elder. Uh, that's the term we use. It's the only one time is it ever used as a noun, and we use it for everything. <laughs> only one time in the scriptures does it use the term as a pastor, but we make it a title. And so uh, we'll talk about that more maybe here in a few minutes. But uh, anyway, the pastor and then evangelist. Uh, some people would not think evangelist could be an elder in a local house, but we don't have a lot of scripture to reason from, but Philip was an evangelist. Now, he did go down to Samaria, but outside of that, you find him settled in the region, region of Caesarea where he raised up four daughters who prophesied. So apparently he was equipping the saints in the local house. We mostly see evangelists as traveling ministry. I'm not saying they can't travel, but they are, that's a gift of equipping the saints. So we would say any of the five fold doesn't mean that they're automatically an elder, but that's a prerequisite for an elder. And let me tell you why this is so important. Without the grace to govern, you're giving somebody something that God hasn't given them. 
So if you set people as elders with the means to equip saints, the means to oversee, the means to shepherd the flock, the means to feed them, and you put somebody in that place that doesn't have the grace, one of those fivefold ministries. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. So if I put on you governments and the gift hasn't given you that grace, it's going to do a couple of things. I'm going to tell you what it's going to do. It's going to cause you to take on a burden that you don't have the grace for. And you're going to be frustrated. In fact, it could, in my, my experience, I've seen even hinder that person because they are in an area that God hasn't intended for them to carry. And they go down the hill oftentimes rather than rise up. I can tell if I walk into a congregation, I'm working with a congregation and that pastor has a true team of five-fold ministry with them, or that lead elder has a true five-fold ministry team, man, you get with them and they're sparking one another and, and, and it's, there's, there's dynamics there, there's strength there and there's caring. If you have a group of called elders who don't have a clear five-fold ministry gifting, you're always trying to bring them up to date. You're always trying to encourage them. You're always having to prop them up because they're not, they don't have the grace to do it. And it's frustrating. And I see that happening all the time where people say, well, we have our elders and I don't want to judge the situation unless God gave me the entrance. But a lot of times they're not true five-fold ministry elders. And there's such a distinction between the lead guy and the rest of the elders. Yes, there should be a greater grace as a leader, but there ought to be a clear team of those elders in that regard. So then uh, Peter says this, and then I'll stop teaching after this and we'll talk. Uh, then Peter uh, says two things. He says, he says to them, I want you to do two things. He says, I'll say to, to the elders uh, that are among you, he says, shepherd the flock. Poimaino is the Greek word, and it means to feed the flock. It's translated in this translation here. I guess I'm reading from the ESV, ESV, and it's translated as shepherd or pastor the flock. So that would be one of the job descriptions of an elder. An elder does two things. He pastors and he bishops. So really a bishop and an elder is one the same. But the bishop is the job description. That's why he says to the elders in Ephesus of Acts 20, to guard yourselves and the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops. He says to the elders, you're bishops. So a bishop and elders want the same thing, but he says they're to whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The overseers is the activity, the bishoping and the pastoring. The pastoring is the feeding the flock. The bishoping is overseeing their souls and warning them in sin. Now, I don't have any authority over anybody that the scripture doesn't have. So, but if I go to a brother and say, hey, I, I've observed uh, and I've seen this transgression, I'd like to talk to you about in the scripture, I'm bishoping him. If I'm going discipling him uh, in the scriptures or feeding him, I'm pastoring him. Sometimes they overlap while you're discipling, God deals with their heart. That's bishoping. So it's, it's two jobs of uh, an elder. We love to shepherd, but we don't like to bishop. <laughs> That's why he says, do it willingly, not under constraint. Uh, so those are the two things. Exercising oversight, that word is episcopos or bishoping. So we see the elder having to have a... Uh, clear distinction of the fivefold. And we can talk about how we notice that and find that and discover that and know that later. But for right now, let me stop there and let's dialogue. And uh, some of you that have uh, walked this out of the years, you're feel free to, to talk. Uh, some of you that have got questions, feel free to ask questions. I want us to be real open here uh, because I have seen some uh, consequences some real consequences 
Uh, and most of the time when a pastor has elders that are not of the fivefold ministry, they're frustrated. They come to me and they say, I can't get these guys to step up. I'm saying, well, could it be you've given them something God has to give them the grace for? And then not every elder has the same grace. I mean, if you have two people that are both pastoral gift, they don't have the same measure. Even two teachers don't have the same measure. Two apostles don't have the same measure. Two prophets don't have the same measure because each one's commission. That's why Paul says we can't compare ourselves among ourselves. We can't look at somebody and say, well, that's what a pastor does. Well, well, you know, yeah, there are some, but be careful making profiles unless it becomes comparisons. Your grace that you function in and, uh, that's one of the reasons we, we're discussing more even around here. We don't use the term pastor, but we've started using the, the term a number of years ago, campus pastor, because I was kind of given oversight and Jonathan and, and John stepped more in those areas of campus pastor. But if we're not careful, that can become positional. And the rest of the team not feel like they're included. And so we're, in, we're at the point right now of revisiting that and dialoguing, talking about that. So, well, I could go on and on. So I need to just stop and let some of you guys jump in. Whoever's talking, we're not hearing very well, so. Okay, I have a question. When you talk about um, raising up elders amongst the body and um, giving time for that to identify. I know you talk really good about the six yeses, and I understand um, all of that. But my question is, is typically, how long does it take usually for somebody coming into the body before they might be recognized publicly as an elder? How long is that process? How long does that usually take? The, the time to watch somebody and, and know when I'm going to recognize them, it's a sure thing. What's that time usually? Dan referenced the, the, the six yeses, and I think that is part of the, the process. And as you will know, and you would tell me, uh, there is no time because each person is in their spiritual walk and growth. Sometimes people are discovering their fivefold gift and they're emerging in it. They're coming forth in it. Sometimes they haven't been challenged in it. They haven't been released in it. They haven't been urged. And I'll tell you why this is so important, guys. Let me jump in here on this. I don't mean to get, bring me back to this, Dan, uh, if, I, if I don't fully answer your question. But this is another aspect. If you put guys and gals in place of authority that don't have the grace for it, you end up excluding people that have the grace that you've not embraced. Let me say what I mean. If I put, if we embrace elders here at Desi Life that would probably be deacons or would not have the grace of one of the five gifts, over a period of time, the young ones that are being raised up that truly have a five-fold gift, they don't have a place. And you'll lose them. Because what they see is the pastor and these so-called elders are the board. And they associate eldership as boardship. <laughs> and that's what they see it as. They don't see it as functioning in a gift because these guys who are serving is this way, they don't have the grace. And so therefore they're not functioning in that and they're not pastoring and shepherding and they're not standing in that place of authority. So what happens, the others who are emerging and being brought up, they look over, they go, well, there's no place for me. There's no place for my expression. And that's what you have in most churches. You have a pastor, uh, a deacon board, they call an elder board. And then you have your associates on staff. You have your your pastors on staff and those pastors on staff have no government in the church. They have government over their area. They may be over youth. They may be over young adults, but they really don't have governments in the pilotage of the ship. And they should be developed and brought in eventually. They can sit with elders before they long, before they have uh, the authority to be ordained as elders. Sometimes 
Uh, John, you often remind us uh, that you sat with us five or six years before you were ordained as an elder, meaning uh, because it's kind of apprenticeship, you know, we're, we're acknowledging the gifts and grace. Is that right, John? Yes, that's correct. It was uh, uh, five and a half years. John is yeah. the on the go Zoom. He is doing so much administration. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. I forgot that's probably what you're doing. I should have left you on the on the logo. Uh, but that's really important. And so the time involved, there is no time involved, and you don't have to be in a hurry. I remember when we launched over here in Owasso in 2008. It would have been in 2010 or 11, around that time, we were teaching in our School of Ministry 301, what I'm teaching you right now, and the six yeses of how to identify these. And people raised their hand in the class and said, are we going to ever ordain elders here in Owasso? And I said, well, sure. We're not going to appoint them. We're going to watch, see what God does. And they said, well, we already know who three of them are. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's when it's working. And sure enough, the three that they mentioned, we end up ordaining in 2012. So we were here probably four years and every one of these were proven ministries. <laughs> they weren't brand new converts. You know, they, they, had, they had given of themselves for years and God just happened to give us a good team of people who come in. Uh, they're in Claremore because we were growing in it, learning in it. It was six years probably. So there's no time frame on it at all. But it depends on a good example was with, with Ron. I was down there with Ron when he was launching and he'd get, get going very well. Uh, and Ron, I don't remember what year that Brandon and Tia came over, but I'm sitting in a meeting with them with their leaders. And the Holy Spirit said, I've set him here to be an elder. Well, that doesn't make him one just because the Holy Spirit said that. There has to be place of, but, but Brandon had served for years. He was proven. The trust was there, you know, it was not a lack. And all he has to do, those other things have to come along. And those, those yeses, I'll just do those real quick. Dan, you know these, you refer to them, is the first of all, that person has to know they have a distinctive call from God in one of the five gifts, and they have to have said yes to that call. If I'm telling them they're called, that's not it. Well, somebody prophesied over me years ago, that's not it. <laughs> You got to know that God's called you. Otherwise, it's going to be tested. Number two, maybe not in this order, but they have to know that God has set them in that house and they're like a son or daughter in that house. They, they're a part of that house. They are part of that place that God has placed them. So they're saying yes to the vision of the house and to the authority of the house. They got to say yes to the authority of the house. They've got to be in submission if you're not faithful to that which is another man's, God's not going to give you your own. He's not going to extend spiritual authority to you if you're not faithful with what belongs to somebody else. And so you're coming in to serve under them. So that's those are three yeses. And then they've got to say yes to people. If they're not pastoring people, if they're not teaching people, if they're not eldering people, if they're not discipling people, they're not elders. They're not ready at least. Because some people go, well, if you just ordain me, bless God, I'll show you what kind of man of God and woman of God. No, 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 no. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that you should already be embraced in doing that. And if you've got to have a title ordination, as long as you're saying, I can't wait till they ordain me, we're not going to ordain you. If you're saying, well, why aren't I ordained? We're not going to ordain you. In other words, I don't want any of the flesh to be going, pick me, pick me, pick me, because that's an orphan heart. That's saying, I'm not willing to do this until you acknowledge who I am. I'd rather acknowledge the gifts and grace in you, and I don't want to turn eldership into position. Otherwise, we'll get people thinking, we got two classes of Christians in the house. We got regular Christians, and we got elder Christians, you know, and we got five-fold ministry Christians, and we've got other Christians. That's why we don't emphasize the five-fold ministry, except among those whom we've taught to go make disciples out of the Romans 12 gifts of mercy and compassion and administration and giving. And <laughs> if you're not functioning in those and making disciples and caring for people while you do that, then we will see your fivefold ministry gift. 
You'll see your fivefold ministry gift out of the people that you're merging in. And so that's really that's why we're always after people who you're caring for, who you're pastoring, who you're shepherding, are you carrying the load of the house? And then you'll know they'll carry the load of the house. They'll be concerned about so and so. They're not been here lately, and I've been out here uh, caring for them. And you know, is there anybody else I can work with you on? And uh, you know, you, they brought these people into the church, and they're discipling with this couple, and they're walking through this with them. And I mean, they are doing it because you've made place for them. And that's the thing we've got to do. We got to make place for them that's not positional. We got to make place for them that's gift and grace oriented. And so then as they come into it, that's the four, 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 fourth yes. And then the fifth one is I like to have an affirmation like we did with Brandon. You know, Ron, I see him as a pillar of the house. I see God could put him as an elder. So I want an outside confirmation. I don't want this to be a destiny life decision. We want prophets and apostles and those who are outside can come in and affirm. We want relationship. We want people in and out. You know, I said, yeah, boy, I see them as a pillar of the house. Boy, I see that gift. I see that grace. And I mean, James, you know, really serves as a prophet among us. And sometimes just a little word, he might say, boy, I've had the deacons on my heart. And that sparks me, you know, because I, I know something is being seen. So we're looking for those confirmations. We're looking for those things. From, and then the, the last yes is it's so respected among the people as they labor that by the time you ordain them, they go, we could have done that three or four years ago. And that's what we had in the class. We go, well, we already know who they are. And sure enough, that's who they were, you know, because they had seen these people already doing it. It wasn't something we're going to ordain. And if people go, now, why did they ordain them? We're way too early. There's no evidence of it. But if, but if you're laboring together, they see you as a team of pastors, leaders, care givers and and you're leading together they go well it's about time we ordain them they're already doing this then what what have you got you got the consent of the people it seems good to us and the holy spirit and there's no division out of that mm -hmm. so we don't want to wait uh i mean we don't want to do something and then make it happen we'd rather let god rebuild it so i, I did glenn, a little bit more teaching than i wanted to do on that let's have some more comments go ahead yeah glenn uh just let me make a comment we're always in a hurry. We want to hurry up and get things done. But if you look at what, how God operates, God's never in a hurry. He lets things develop and work. I remember as far as a personal experience, I came here probably really settled in in about 87, but I was not ordained as an elder until 2004. And I know exactly why, because there were other guys that came in at the same time as me that were ordained many years before me. I'll never forget, we were sitting at Mazio's one Wednesday night at an elders meeting. We went around the, around the uh, table and you asked the question, if you could labor in any area of the work here, what would it be? And I, I watched every one of those guys had some place that they would labor. But when it came to me, I had nothing. And I'll, I remember for years, you told me, James, submerge yourself in the people. Submerge yourself in the people. I didn't know what he was talking about, guys. Finally, it dawned on me, care for the people. And it was only after that transpired and it was a process i mean it didn't happen overnight but only as after that had transpired was i ordained as an elder and i've seen this time after time we're in a hurry we want to hurry up and get this done because we got a lot of work to do i think that's part of and and i don't want to get off into another area but i think that's a, a an area of some of our thinking about the return of Christ, you know, it's going to hurry up and come and we got to hurry up and we got to hurry up and do this. And, and no, 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 no. God's not in a hurry. Be patient. It will come to pass. Even how many years was it for Paul before he was commissioned as an apostle? 
and sent out. There is plenty of time to do the work of the Lord. If we believe in the sovereign Lord that he is over all and he is working all things according to his purpose, his purposes will be performed. Rest in him. Very good. I appreciate James is place in this house right now because he carries such a heart. Every time I walk down the hall early Sunday morning or whenever it might be, he's got somebody in the office talking to them. Some of the leaders are coming in and talking with him. He's pouring into them. Young men all the time pouring into him. He's being more fruitful right now than ever in any of the years of his ministry. And half the people wouldn't even know anything about it. And that's that is the what we're that's what we're after. Some of you other guys jump in here. Well, I'll I'll just say quickly uh, to tag on really for everything y'all said. I thought was so so very good. For me, it comes down to this: the distinction for me, even in Dan's question, is it's the difference between appointing something and recognizing something. You know, like that's the key in my mind, like, am I appointing somebody to something that they're not necessarily doing it? Or am I just recognizing somebody that's already doing what we're saying? And we're just saying yes and amen to it. I mean, obviously similar to the, to the six yeses there, we're just confirming really, uh, and not appointing. So for me, that's a real key distinction because, you know, if they're already doing it, you're just bringing recognition to it. So Uh, very good. Very good. And I can I can see what everybody's saying here. Coming from a, a small church like we have, and we've been here about five years now too. We uh, we really haven't appointed any elders. We've got one deacon that we've appointed. And sometimes we feel the, the necessity that we think we have to go ahead and quickly get somebody in position. And, and I have even, even seen with positions in the church, not elders or deacons, but other positions that when you fill a position just to be filling a position, it can turn into trouble. And we're, we're trying to be patient. And I believe God is starting to send us some people that we we can ordain as, as elders, but I, I think that development time for them to, to serve in the church, some of them have just come recently in the last few months, and I think they need that time to develop in the church and let people see them and, and let people begin to respect them because if they don't have that respect, then they're not gonna be able to serve very well. And it, sometimes it takes time for that respect to happen. But it, it just speaks to us, and it, I really feel like what you're saying is good. That's good, Gene. It's all, it's awfully hard to unelder, unordain someone. <laughs> oh, it's 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 difficult. And another another thing too is that because we see in the scriptures that Paul sent Titus uh, to ordain elders in every city, we believe Paul was. Uh, was not only an apostolic leader, I believe so was Titus. He includes Titus and Timothy in his words when he says, we apostles. In Thessalonians, he includes uh, Silvanus and, and Timothy, we apostles. So he had these spiritual sons, so to speak, that were functioning apostolically. So with that in mind, we don't ordain anyone without having someone in from the outside that we're in relationship with. When I say from the outside, I mean, I don't want to be one who just ordain our own elders. I want this to be something that we're walking out with apostolic prophetic leaders that affirm what we're doing so that we're not just an entity within ourselves. We're not here in Claremore or, or Wasso doing our own thing. I want there to be an accountability outside of ourselves because what if in the process there becomes a problem? You know, I need someone that has a relationship that can step in. I need someone who can be an arbitrator. I need someone that the people respect because they've labored there and they have a spiritual authority among us. 
I think that's important uh, as you go forward. And so I always caution people not to just jump out there and, and determine this is it and we're going to ordain these as elders. I would encourage you to have uh, someone that you respect that walks out walk life with you and walks out uh, really as an apostolic overseer, really, honestly, and, and has the understanding of it so that when it is done, it's done something that the people see is more important than just what we did. It's a covering of, of accountability and it does something in the house when it's not ordained just by those local elders themselves. Uh, because if we're not careful, we'll, we'll start picking among ourselves whom we think ought to be rather than having counsel to let's look at the, the way those things are raised up there and should be. So very good. Kendrick? Yeah, I think uh, this book should be retitled Time. It should be just T-I-M-E. That's what's just, that's the name <laughs> of it, right? Because it takes... I'm gonna put, well, I'm going to put that in the, uh, the sub, subtitle or something. I mean, we need a warning about this as we read it because we read it and we go to the ATI and we see in ATI, uh, we see in, in, in the hub of Destiny Life, we see the functionality of it. And sometimes you can see it so well in your head. I think when I read this, I, I just grasped it. I understood it so well, um, but we can see it so well in, our, in the functionality around us and in our heart and our mind. Um, but it takes, there's such a distance between seeing it and then seeing it worked out in our uh, body. And um, for us, I think it worked to our benefit because that time enabled us to really see the potential of the people, the potential of, of equipping the saints, like that foundation of equipping how to be laid. We didn't have a team starting out, we're understanding apostolic government, we're coming into this revelation. And so like, Thankfully, early on, my mentality was not, I need elders. My mentality was like, oh, snaps, we can equip the saints and, and, and understanding their potential to function apostolically because they're being equipped by apostles, their potential to function pastorally. So we just got leaders and we began to pour and equip because we recognize that um, for myself, I, I won't include uh, Elizabeth in that, but for myself, I'm not um, that pastoral. So I, I realized early on, like I need pastoral people around me and that doesn't have to be an elder that needs that I can raise up a team that are caring for the saints. And so we've gone a long time without really filling a void just because of that time frame of equipping the saints and, and seeing them really walk in the fullness of their uh, potential. And then at the same time, um, that distance of time, me recognizing that the emergence of gifts around me has just as much to do with me and my growth and my emergence as it does them. And so we're starting to recognize that there are some gifts that are, um, that we are acknowledging that we're seeing, um, and they're emerging. Um, but the development of their gift has a lot to do with the development of my gift. So I'm not in a rush because Elizabeth and I understand that we're just emerging in our gift, you know? And so it's like, as we emerge in the gift of God and the government of God and the authority of Christ in us, we're very convinced that it just happens naturally. All of a sudden, these gifts start emerging around us because these gifts, this team of elders primarily is being equipped and they emerge out of that main apostolic grace and gift and so our focus really has been equipping the saints and then elizabeth and i recognizing we have a lot of growing to do so let's continue to emerge in the gift and the grace and as we're doing that out of the saints that we're pouring into we're seeing that gift and grace it's amazing how natural this process really is when we focus on the right things and so that's kind of been our story yeah, yeah, that's, that's so really, good. really good. I was going to share too, Glenn. I think uh, what Kendrick said about time. I know from my own experience, I've got several stories about this, you know, but just realizing 
you know, we talk a lot about 1 Corinthians 12, how God places us in the church, and that's not just placing people that they need to stay here and be a part of our local congregation, but also how he sees fit to distribute each gift and put people in place. And, and uh, I think it does take time because God's given us a stewardship, not a control over those things. I know my own experience, when I've tried to move too fast, it's hurt me. And you know a lot of the story. I see where Brandon came and God really did that and how that worked. And it was a quicker thing. Uh, but then there was another another guy that came in that was prophetic and we were so excited about him and started to give him, you know, some influence. And man, it just it turned out it really was a fiasco because we didn't really know him. And and we didn't and think, you know, we didn't install him as an elder, but we had that like thought like, OK, this this could be. But but it is in that process of time that we get to know people and we get to see, you know, are they going to carry uh, with us, you know, there's a guy here now uh, that is absolutely a fivefold gifted teacher and a great brother, but he still has not begun to carry the people. And and so he is here. He's a part. We utilize his gift. He teaches every now and again, and and uh, you know he's a you know part of the body, but he just does not carry people. And and I don't know if that's even in his heart even though he's qualified. And so I just can't emphasize that enough, what Kendrick say is time. And one of the things I was going to say as well for, for the guys that are on the call and for me as well is to give yourself time to see how God develops you. And, you know, we talk about that. I know for me, you know, in the beginning, when I started learning about this, we talk about APEST, you know, it's kind of like, well, what am I, who am I, you know, where's my place? But, but also giving yourself time to develop and see your gifts and the grace that's on your life and not rushing, you know, to aspire to something, uh, but really letting God, you know, organically pull those gifts out of you and that grace and that measure being exposed rather than trying to grab for those things. And, I, you know, I remember years ago when we were, uh, I want to say 2015, when I was at ATI, I remember you were talking about the church in that year at the June conference, and I was rooming with a guy from another state, and, and we were traveling to one of the morning services, and he was just so fired up, and, you know, he said, man, I just see it now. I'm an apostle, and, and you know, I'm going to go back and set things in order, and, you know, I'm going to do all these things, and, and I just remember thinking, even in that van ride, I remember thinking, I just don't see that on your life, you know? I mean, it was, I didn't say that to him. I just remember thinking that, like, man, I just, and, and you know, his story, uh, he went back and split the church. He lost his marriage, lost, I mean, pretty much lost everything, you know, by going too fast and aspiring to something. And so I think what Kendrick said about time is so important on so many levels when you start talking about the church, allowing God control of the church and those things to develop and come out naturally and it, it being expressed through his purpose and seasons not us trying to grab something and do something and control something very good hey glenn could i tag on to that to say you know when we think of the government of god uh we think sometimes the local gathered church that government but the government of god begins in every one of us i mean you know what i'm saying that's all these guys on here are the, are the leaders of the local work. And the reality is it has to happen in us. That's what Ron's saying, Kendrick, is the government of God is going to break me, you know, before there's any government in the local house. It's got to break me or I'm not going to carry the people. I'm going to lord over them, you know, it's it, instead of serving them and caring for them. So his government's got to be at work in, in me. I, what you guys shared I thought was great. Really good. One of the things I will throw this in here is the discipleship process. There needs to be uh, some means of vetting and growing and discipling people. And otherwise, you just jump from this to that. You can't jump from here into a positional. If you jump from something to something, then you're positional. If you grow it naturally, it just becomes revealed. 
but you've got to have things in place to help grow. And I, I believe that this Christianity 101 and the way we have our weekend retreat for healing and transformation and then developing the discipleship process and then even taking them further into spiritual formations that you're working with people all the time, but there needs to be some means for which that process to happen. Uh, and everywhere we, we have skipped that process, it's come back and bit us every time. Well, this person is so gifted, things don't work out for them, their schedule doesn't allow for this, and you pull them in beyond the discipleship process. Sometimes we've discovered they weren't humble enough to take Christianity 101 because they see it too simple. <laughs> They're not humble enough to buy in. And the people that God has raised up and sent to us have never thought that. They're happy to embrace it. I mean, that's true for all of you, but you know, Jonathan, you just spoke and you guys moved in here 2012 or 13. You know, in, in all, all re reality, that's not been that long ago. But the first thing they did is went through 101, Christianity 101. Well, he used to teach Christianity 101. Went through encounter retreats. He used to lead encounter retreats. Went through 201. He used to do that. But that's not the point. It's not, the, it's not knowledge. It's becoming a part of the DNA of that house. It's, it's God, what are you working in me? And so I would encourage for us to know that there has to be some systematic discipleship. I, I wouldn't call it a vetting system, but it becomes a vetting system. <laughs> uh, some system of, of growing people so that then they have a place to release them into care of ministry for people out of their Romans 12 gifts. Then we talk about the fivefold later. Then we talk about eldership later because we're discovering what's there. So I hope this has been helpful to you. We've been going for right at an hour now. I'd be interested in seeing what your interest is. Uh, I had said, if there's further interest from today, we could try this again. We have a staff meeting here on Tuesday mornings. And even if it's not finished, I could jump on at 11 uh, for a couple of weeks here. I'm not saying this has to be ongoing, but until we felt like we have scratched the itch that's there. If you haven't read our book, The Apostolic Government of the 21st Century, uh, I would ask you to do that. Uh, you can get it by hollering at us or go on um, Amazon and order it and get that book. I think it will be uh, helpful to you. Uh, any other comments? We want to wrap this up in the next four or five minutes, but I want to give room for anybody else want to make a comment and wrap up. Jerry, you want to add anything uh, to this before we wrap up? No, I, I think it's good, Glenn. Okay. Good. I, I, can I ask that? one question? Yes. I I know everybody on here, but my brother Alex. Uh, hi, I'm John. I'm from Claremore campus here in Dusty Life. Uh, so it's great to meet you. Thank you for joining us. So in Alex's hello. words, in Alex's words, Ron gave him an embarrassing introduction. So <laughs> Oh, I missed that part. I joined late. Sorry. Yeah. yeah but, well, there may be several of you did, but uh, Alex, go ahead. And uh, since you've already gotten the embarrassing uh, <laughs> introduction, give us your introduction for just a moment. Say hi to the guys before we wrap up here. Yeah. Hey, John. Nice to meet you. Um, so as Ron mentioned earlier, and for those that didn't, um, that weren't on the, the call then, my wife and I, Melissa and our daughter, Ariana, which is, she just turned six and a half. Um, we are planting a church in Central East Florida and, um, and just being a part of um, just the principles of ATI, um, just hearing the things that are shared. Uh, the few people that I talked to, um, there, there was a conference that took place in Florida down at Coastal Chapel and um, we weren't able to attend, but we took the weekend and we watched all the videos. When I say we, my wife and I. And um, man, I just felt like I couldn't do anything for about two to three days because I felt like my head just got hit with a brick. 
And um, as I just continued to kind of process things, I, I, I kind of refer to it as a time where I was born again, again. Um, and it's so much of just, in order to learn something new, or, and, and Ron and I talk about this all the time, it's, it's having to unlearn something old. And, um, and, and just hearing everything that's being shared here, I'm just so very thankful to God that regardless if this church is planted or not, that we are able to understand the true um, biblical teachings of being a true son to God and having that sonship and not trying to strive out of an orphan spirit. There's so much that could be said. And, um, and since I am sharing, I'll just say this real quick. Uh, I think the theme that I just keep hearing is my least favorite word, and it's the word patience. Um, J James started with it and, and people just kind of talked about it. Kendrick said something in that Florida conference in order to build something right, you have to build it slow. I would talk to Ron on a weekly basis. He's like, man, you need to just take your time, no press. And I'm like, what's he talking about? There's stuff to do, you know, and, and just on and on and on. And, and just for us, and, and if I could just share this, we've made a shift recently um, because, you know, we're, we're planting AG, CMN and all that, um, we, you need to have a launch date. You need to have a date. And by these dates, you need to work backwards, 12 months out, nine months out, 10 months out, six months out. And we really made this shift from, um, dates and timelines more to phases and outcomes. And once we made that shift, so much pressure, just as an individual was just, taken off and said, you know what, we're going to continue to be faithful to what God's called us to do, but we're going to rely on God for the outcome. Um, so anyways, I just, just to share that a part of the introduction. So I am very, very, very thankful um, to be a part of, of this call today. That Alex, thank you for sharing that. And, and Ron, I know we have probably put that link out, but if I haven't, John, if we don't, if we haven't attached that few days of teaching on ATI, uh, if it's not on our Facebook, and if it's not, uh, one time it was on our Facebook, and if it's not on our website, uh, it needs to be. Uh, really great. I was, I couldn't be any more proud of all the teaching that was done. And uh, Ron edited Jonathan out because he didn't think his was very good. But other than that, the teaching was... I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> For whatever reason, we didn't get Jonathan, one of Jonathan's teachings. I don't remember what, what it was and one of mine, but I, I thought the teachings were excellent. And I mean, it was so quality. So thank you, Alex, for reminding us of that. Uh, Ron, could we be reminded of that link again and maybe this group of emails, if you want to just respond that, I put this out with all of y'all's emails. If you would just attach that, if you don't mind, send that back to us and say, hey, here's here's the conference in the East Coast ATI that we were talking about. It'd be worth everybody taking some time and listen if you haven't seen it. It is quality stuff. I'm, in fact, it's we call it the apostolic the school of the apostolic it was number one there's number two and number three which we haven't done but that number one was excellent and it wouldn't hurt to redo that sometime so all right hey guys it's been a delight if you're interested we will try this again next week tuesday at uh 11 a.m and uh, jonathan fox you want to close us out in prayer or say anything before we go feel free to to do that and and uh thank you for joining with me a couple times just on our own. And so I hope this is okay too. So yeah, I'll definitely pray us out. Um, Father, thank you so much for um, these connections, these divine connections that we have um, for these parts of impartation. There is really a lot of things in, inside here that you can't read and, uh, and just apply. There are things that have to come through your spirit and I'm thankful for uh, my brothers and sisters on this call that um, some of that loneliness of trying to handle this stuff alone, uh, trying to 
make things happen, trying to feel the pressure of if we do these things and everything will be okay. And if we can move forward, then everything will be all right. Just really realizing that you are working, you always have been, and you always will be. And because of that, because of us being your sons and daughters, uh, you know, we don't have to fret about your work. You are doing something. I pray that our eyes are open to discover that and whatever place we are in that. Some of us, some of us have elders, some of us don't, some of us were trying to figure that out. I just, I'm thankful for every journey and asking just blessing as we take our pace. Uh, and as James said, for some people, it's going to be a little bit faster for other people. It's going to be a little bit slower according to the work that you're doing in us. And so yes. just thank you for your grace. And we really do love you. And thank you for ATI. Thank you for Glenn and the team for even doing things like this to help us out, to help us understand, to help us learn. Bless them. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, yeah. enjoy it. And uh, Jonathan Schaffner, y'all didn't get to hear from him, but he's, uh, what, about 30 minutes from us. And Sweet Brother's got a heart for the church. And uh, wave at him, John's. So hey, everybody. And we, if we get meet back up next Tuesday, which I will be here, I will be available. Email me or text me with your interest, and uh, we will – continue our conversation and hear from more of you. We might start off next week with just questions, okay? And then go out from there. So, excellent. Awesome. Hey, Fox, I loved hearing your kids in the background. Yeah. It was a blessing. Awesome. Amen. He, he's after it right now. Hey. By the way, I, I will send you all a link to this recording, too, if you want to pass it around. You're welcome to do that. Awesome. Thank you. Bless you guys. Bye-bye. Love y'all. See you guys.